Lucky Land Casino asking people what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kids' PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Voidware prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. With Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. <gasps> no, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. With Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. This is Beijing Bound, the countdown to the 2022 Winter Olympic Games. I'm Michael. I'm John. And for the first time in 30 years, Great Britain will have a long track speed skater competing at the Olympic Games in a month's time. It's also two months till the start of the Beijing Paralympics, with five British curlers confirmed as the first names on the plane to China. We'll hear from Chef de Mission Phil Smith in a moment. But it's 27-year-old Cornelius Kirsten who will make his Team GB debut in China after a top-10 finish in the recent World Cup series. The first Brit to do that in 36 years. He'll compete in the 1,000 metres and 1,500 metres and told us from his base in Holland he can't wait. Hi guys, I'm Cornelius Kirsten. Um, I've been selected for Team GB and I'll be the first British long tracker to represent Team GB at the Games for 30 years. Yeah, 1992, Craig McNichol was your predecessor. This will feel for, for people watching in the UK like a new sport. Tell us about long track speed skating then um so long track is um slightly different to short track whereas with short track you're actually racing people in long track there's just two people in the track um the track's also a lot bigger it's 400 meters and um the biggest difference is that um it's essentially it's just a time trial you're doing so everybody will just start and go go out as fast as they possibly can um throw themselves through corners with about 40 miles an hour and then the difference as well is that like whoever wins the race doesn't necessarily win the actual race because you usually go about 20 people in a race or 30, depending on the event, and everybody can win it. And why has it taken so long to get another person back at the, the biggest stage of all? Well, two reasons. There isn't like long track is quite a small sport. Um, there also isn't a rink in the UK. So for training, they would have to go to the Netherlands, to Canada, Germany or wherever. Um, so that requires a bit more effort. And also for long track, it's quite hard to actually qualify for the games. So qualifying works through the World Cups. And at the World Cups, you need to do um, a top 30 qualification to make it to the games. So just to be able to go to the games, you're aiming to be top 30 in the world, which is already quite an elite group that you're part of. And especially with the level in long track, it can be quite hard to get there. Um, and then if you on top of that don't have like a rink in your home country, so you need to like travel abroad to go train, uh, that all just adds a few bumps in the road. Certainly a few bumps, as you say, Cornelius. Talk about those World Cups. You mentioned them. I think the last one you did was in December and then and they were the final qual- qual- or quota places up for grabs. And, and that obviously then with your performances there got you this, this nomination. Yeah. So I managed to get a top 10 in the 1,000 metres and I got a top, yeah, top 30. So I came in 22nd, I think, or 23rd on the 1,500. Um, so I'm incredibly proud that I managed to get those there and find a lot of consistency this season within especially 1,000 metres where I've actually uh, yeah, I've really been able to excel there and be consistent competitor at the World Cups. So I was really proud about that. And then, yeah, the nomination came in today. So I'm, yeah, 
I'm excited to be on words. Like it's like I've said before, it's a, it's a childhood dream to be able to represent Team GB and go to the Olympic Games. So to be able to do that and to be able to do that like on top of my game right now, it's it's an amazing feeling. You mentioned there's no track in Britain. You're actually based in Holland, and and, yeah. and, and that's where you were born. But your your mum's British, so where's she from? Tell us a bit about that. How that all works. Um, so my mum's from London, Islington, and um, she came to the Netherlands for an internship. I met a very nice Dutch guy, and uh, that's where I came from. We're still together, still happily ever after. Um, but also due to work, she decided to stay here, and yeah, that's also why we continue to live here and have not moved anywhere else. And what have been the challenges in terms of the qualification with you being based in the Netherlands, but not as far as the Netherlands sports system is concerned, an elite athlete, and therefore, I guess, struggling to get on the ice and get training time? Yeah, so the last few years, that was a real struggle where I'd be on ice at like 7 or 30 in the morning until about 8.30, and especially for skating, which is a very um, taxi hard sport, so you really need to be awake um was quite rough and doing a lot of training by myself um but this year i was very lucky to be adopted like adopted by a dutch skating team and um because of that i actually got dutch elite status so i managed to get good facilities finally get some consistency in training um and also managed to like train through the lockdown that's going on in the netherlands right now whereas like elite athletes can still go to the rink and train so i'm very lucky there and powered by coffee. You are a, a coffee aficionado and now a coffee entrepreneur. Yes. So um, coffee's kind of like always been, or always like, I don't know, since I can remember, I've always loved coffee. And I've always been playing around with brewing my own coffee, trying to find the best beans. Um, and especially whenever I went traveling, like coffee's always been an essential part of my race practice. Kind of like whenever I gear up for a race, about two, two and a half hours before the race. I'll take a moment to relax and brew myself a nice cup of coffee. And that's kind of like the last moment we go like, and then about, you know, was it three years ago now I was in Japan and um, I found a company or I found small coffee filters there. And I was like, this is amazing. Cause like these filters, you could just literally put on your mug and then you could very easily brew coffee wherever you were. Because before that I'd always bring my beans, I'd bring my grinder. I bring a machine to make coffee. So I, I'd almost need to check an extra suitcase just to bring that. And then I saw that and I was like, oh, that, that's amazing. And then I came back here, couldn't find it anywhere. And that's kind of like when me and Elle, like, cause I started to go with my girlfriend earlier. It kind of like clicked for us that we're like, okay, we uh, don't have any massive sponsors and it's quite expensive. We also love coffee. Why don't we just bring those two passions together? And that's where Brew 22 came from. Um, and that's, so that's been going for about yeah, two and a half years now, two years since our official launch. Um, and extremely proud of like, the steps we've been able to make. I've uh, got one of our filters here right now. And uh, I can just show you guys how it works. So you get the filter, you just open it up. And then in there, you've got this filter that's just filled with coffee. And what you do is you just take off the top and then there's like actual fresh coffee beans in there. And then you put that in your mug and it just hangs in there and then you can just really easily brew coffee while on the road. So when you're in a hotel, usually you'll have a kettle there or something like that. And then you just get good coffee. And it's important. I mean, Michael and I have spoken, Cornelius, to so many Olympians over the last few years or so. And people know about national lottery funding and UK sport funding. But Brew 22 is effectively helping you get to Beijing. Absolutely. So I, I, I feel this game, I've been lucky enough to get like a little bit of funding from uh, or some funding from the BOA. Uh, for the last few years, but Elia hasn't had any funding. And um, also just to make ends meet in general, we've had Brute 2 and we've actually like funded ourselves and our Olympic mission with that. Um, so yeah, I'm really proud of how that happened and how we've actually managed to like set up a company and it actually for us to help get further on. Do you have to change the yeah. name after Beijing though? No, <laughs> we get that question a lot, but we're going to keep the name. We uh, like, like the, the name Brew 22 just sounds good. And it's also part of our story. Um, I think it's important to always just remember where you came from. Cause like, that's also part of the mission for Brew 22. Like up until now we've managed to like help fund ourselves, help, help make it to the games. But eventually 
we also want to see like, how we can use Brutons 2 to help other athletes fund themselves as well. Because like not everybody can get lottery funding, not everybody can get UK sport funding, but there's still a lot of athletes that need it. Um, and we understand that. And because we went through this road of like setting up our own company, putting all the work in, and like we've really enjoyed this journey, but we wouldn't recommend another athlete to do it because you put in a lot of time and effort and the time that you kind of like want to have an afternoon nap or something like that. We pop into the office to get some orders done, do, you know, think of new products or try to find some new beans. Um, and then, so, so that does cost you some energy. So that's why we wouldn't recommend other athletes to do it, but we do have a platform now that we eventually want to, we're still figuring out how to do it, but we want to be able to help other athletes there. Final question then, with all those challenges, this morning when you get the nomination, does it feel worth it though? Absolutely, every second I go through it again. It's uh, like I said before, I like guess a childhood dream come through and like today it's really becoming real because kind of like when I finished World Cup Psych, you kind of like know like, okay, these times are good enough. My qualification was good enough. I did the qualification times, so that's all good. But until you kind of like officially hear it from Team GB and you get the official invite, it doesn't 100% feel real yet. And right now it still feels somewhat surreal to be saying like, hey, I'm going to be an Olympian. And yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, it's an amazing feeling. And have you got enough space in your bag for your coffee filters? Well, don't tell them at Team GB yet, but I'm just going to check in an extra suitcase because I'm bringing coffee for everyone. <laughs> well, Brilliant. Chat. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And we will be looking forward to following your progress. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. The Winter Olympics starts on the 4th of February. And one month later, the turn of the Paralympics in Beijing. Five wheelchair curlers are first on the team sheet for Paralympics GB. There's Skip Hugh Niblo. 2014 bronze medalist Gregor Ewan. And three debutantes, Megan Dawson Farrell. David Melrose. And Charlotte McKenna. And Paralympics GB chef de mission Phil Smith told us it's good to now be Beijing bound. A really exciting uh, day for us to finally have some names on the team sheet. It's felt a long time coming, but we're there. And I'm delighted that we've got five wheelchair curlers announced today. It's a lovely mix of experience and new athletes as well. So we've got Gregor Ewan, who's been to a couple of games, including winning a bronze medal in Sochi. We've got Hugh Niblo, uh, who went to Pyeongchang, but was also part of our Paralympic Inspiration Programme in Sochi, where he went to experience the game. So again, someone with experience of a couple of games, albeit just one uh, whilst playing. Um, and then three new athletes, which is fantastic to see um, from our curlers. We've got uh, Megan Dawson Farrell. We've got Charlotte McKenna. Um, and we've got David Melrose. So uh, as a team, they've been playing together quite a bit over this last cycle. And the five of them went to the World Championships just at the back end of last year. Um, so they're a, they're a good team who've played quite a bit together now. But from a Paralympic perspective, it's a really nice blend of experience and newbies. And Phil, you mentioned there about Pyeongchang and, and Sochi. How disappointing was the seventh result or seventh place in Pyeongchang? Because as British curling and, and as enthusiasts every four years here, we always accept that we are or hope that we are going to medal. I know the team were disappointed with the performance and the result out in, uh, in Pyeongchang. Uh, so I think for them to come and they bounced back straight away in 2019. They won the silver medal at the World Championships. Um, and I think that probably showed more of uh, or certainly where they felt they they sat within the world um that they could compete and get into that medal zone um i think the reality is wheelchair curling has become far more competitive over the last cycle or two um as we've seen with lots of para sport um it's more difficult than ever to win a medal um and it's a long competition you know there's there's 12 teams there 11 matches in the round robins so in pyeongchang it didn't quite go their way but i think if they can if they can win a few matches at the start of the week, like they did at the World Championships, uh, once we get out to Beijing and build some momentum, then we're really hopeful that they can go a long way in this tournament. And one of the things I love about the sport of, of curling, uh, wheelchair curling, is the equality in the sport, Phil, because you, you have to have a male and female on the ice, don't you, all the time? Absolutely. So both genders are always represented. And I think you see that in the makeup of the team as well, that, um, we've got the three males and two females, making sure that there is always um, going to be the ability to have a female athlete on ice. And it's fantastic that we've got 
two new female competitors, both making their debuts. Um, Megan obviously has been to a Commonwealth Games before as a, as a wheelchair racer, as an athlete, um, but this will be her first time at a Paralympic Games and we're really looking forward to seeing them. Since wheelchair curling came into the Winter Paralympics in 2006, Canada dominated for the first three editions, but China won last time out and they're now going to be on their, their home ice as well. Who are the other nations to watch out for? Or is it looking at China as the home and the host nation looking at Canada again? China are really strong. We know that. Um, they are the reigning champions. They won the world championships just in October on, on home ice. But um, I think one thing it is worth noting is they only lost two games uh, at that world championships back in October. And one of them was to the Scottish team that will be the Paralympics GB team uh, in in Beijing. So I think a good omen there. And we know that we can compete against the best. But you're right, Canada, traditionally a very strong team. Sweden showed some good form at the uh, the World Championships last time out. And the Russian Federation have also been strong. Um, I think, like we said, there's, there's a number of nations uh, that can challenge in that medal zone. Um, and so it's just good that I think the British athletes are in that mix as well. And as chef Mission, let's widen this conversation out now to the rest of the team, which is yet to be announced. But there must be significant challenges and hurdles still between now and when the games get going in a couple of months' time. Yeah, absolutely. And I think looking at the wider team, we've, we've obviously we've announced our curlers today. We've got all of the snow sport disciplines still to be added to the team. Um, and they're in this slightly unique situation where they're going out to a world championships today. Actually, um, all of the all of the alpine skiers, snowboarders and Nordic team all competing in a world championships in Lillehammer just weeks before the Paralympic Games, uh, which is uh, certainly unique, certainly unusual, but I think does give us a really good opportunity for our athletes to lay down a bit of a marker uh, as to where they sit against the rest of the world. And, and, and so we can see what we might expect in Beijing. Seven medals last time. Phil, is, is that something that you can equal looking to beat? I think one thing we need to probably consider, John, just this time around is, is we've spent a lot of this cycle uh, living through a pandemic. Uh, and, and we found this in Tokyo as well. It was very difficult to predict what was actually going to happen at the Games. Obviously, out in Tokyo, things went very well. We had a very successful Games and we're hoping for similar in Beijing. But I think the reality is it's very difficult to gauge at the moment exactly where we are. We're hoping that our athletes will be able to go out and create medal moments to inspire the nation. And I think one thing that this team will be is our most competitive. Whatever that number of medals looks like at the end of it, I know that we've got more medal opportunities from more athletes in more sports than we've ever had going into a Winter Games, which I think is a brilliant place to be going in. You mentioned the challenges, the uncertainties, the fact that guys could get injured while they're competing at the World Championships. Uh, the uncertainty over over COVID is actually feel the biggest challenge that it was just six months ago that Tokyo happened. Yeah, I think I think there's an element of uh, making sure that we get everyone to the games being our primary function. You know, we we ultimately we we remain a performance focused team. We as Paralympics GB, our ambition is to create environments in all of the villages in Beijing where our athletes can go out and perform and hopefully produce those medal moments those personal best performances but the reality of the situation and the world that we're living in is that alongside that we need to ensure that we're creating a safe and secure environment as well and I think the brilliant thing is that we were able to do that in Tokyo and we were able to get to a position in Tokyo where none of our 226 athletes that went to Tokyo missed getting on the start line because of Covid um, and that's something that we're looking to replicate uh, for Beijing. Not as many athletes, but the challenge remains uh, a significant one. And we've got brilliant people working both at Paralympics GB and within the national governing bodies to support us to make sure that we can meet that ambition. And just finally, before we wrap up with you, Phil, some of us were sat up glued to every minute of the coverage in Tokyo. What can we expect in terms of following Paralympics GB at the Winter Games in terms of that coverage this time around? I mean, it goes without saying that Channel 4 since London have been extraordinary partners for Paralympics GB and the Paralympic movement. And 
they continue to bring uh, the games to UK audiences. And I think that you can expect to see it um, through the night, an opportunity to see our British athletes competing on Channel 4. We will obviously have loads of coverage across all of our Paralympics GB social media channels as well um, for anyone who who doesn't quite manage to get up in the middle of the night um, they'll be able to catch up through the day and we know that Channel 4 will offer the option to catch up through the day as well so there really is no excuse for not keeping tabs on how our brilliant team are doing. And it will also of course be on anything but footy Phil we can guarantee you that. <laughs> Fantastic great to hear that thanks guys. And download our weekly anything but footy podcast for all the latest Olympic and Paralympic news, interviews and conversations we're on Apple and Google Podcasts, just search anything but footy Sports Social Podcast Network Hello it is Ryan and I was on a flight the other day playing one of my favorite social spin slot games on chumbacasino.com I looked over at the person sitting next to me and you know what they were doing they were also playing Chumba Casino coincidence I think not everybody's loving having fun with it Chumba Casino is home to hundreds of casino style games that you can play for free anytime anywhere even at 30,000 feet so sign up now at chumbacasino.com to claim your free welcome bonus that's chumbacasino.com and live the Chumba life no purchase necessary BGW void were prohibited by law see terms and conditions 18 plus.